Okay, says we're streaming live now. I'd like to call this uh, corporate service meeting to order uh, Tuesday, September the 7th at 6.34. Roll call, please. Uh, citizen member Daryl O'Shaughnessy. Citizen member Andy Tamis. Andy, you here? Andy, can you here. hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, citizen member Chris Cooper. Yep. Uh, Vice Chair Lisa McGee. Here. And Chair Ted Strike. Here. Adoption of the agenda. Any additions or deletions? I think, Mr. Chair, we have the land acknowledgement statement. Member Daryl O'Shaughnessy. I don't have that. Okay. You don't have that. Okay. Just one second. One moment, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna share my screen here. I have the minutes up on my screen. Yep, just one moment, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Ted, would, as chair, would you like to read the statement? Be small, but I'll give it a try. Okay, just give me one sec. I'll make it larger for you there. Okay. Well, now you've hidden part of it. I've hidden it? Yeah. The back smaller. Oh, there. Okay. would like to begin by acknowledging that the land in which we work and gather in this traditional unceded territory of the Anagishbe people, the Algonquin nation have lived on this land for thousands of years, long before the arrival of European settlers. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. Perfect. So, so be resolved that the agenda for the Corporate Services Advisory Committee meeting dated Tuesday, September 7th, 2021 be adopted. Any additions or deletions? Mover first, I guess. Chris, seconder. I'll, I'll second us, Andy. Andy. Any additions or deletions? If not, uh, Jennifer, I guess. Okay, perfect. So we have the minutes of the previous meeting, Mr. Chair. The minutes of the Corporate Services Advisory Committee um, listed under item 5A on the agenda be adopted. Mover, please. Chris, Lisa, all in favor? Yep. Great. And then the Did first presentation is the online initiatives that the Corporate Services Advisory Committee received the online initiatives presentation as information. Mover, please. Lisa, Chris, Jennifer. Thank you. I have a presentation that Kayla's going to throw up on the screen. I know it might there's there'll be a bit of repetitiveness here for council members, but it's a good topic for the committee. <laughs> Thanks, Kayla. Um, so tonight I, tonight I wanted to talk to the committee about some online uh, efficiencies. So to give a bit of background, um, in our, the town's 2020 to 2023 STRAT plan, uh, operational and financial efficiencies uh, is considered one of the key priorities. So under each of those priorities, we do have action plans and the action plans uh, do include implementing online initiatives which do include moving to iCity Online, and this is for the viewing of property taxation and utility bills. And we also are looking to move to online payroll management. And when we talk about benefits and added values to these online initiatives, 
Um, by moving to a, a modernized online paperless process, it will create internal efficiencies along with added value services for the town's growing population base. So really with the impact of the global pandemic, it, it really has created that need um, for online services uh, for residents so they can uh, be looking at items uh, without uh, a physical presence in the facilities. To talk about a little bit about the modules themselves. So the iCity Online, this is called a citizen self-service module. What it is, it's a web-based solution and it allows uh, citizens, staff and vendors uh, a variety of functionality online. Uh, they'll be able to log in, they'll be able to view their accounts, their transactions, they'll be able to update their information, they'll be able to make service requests uh, and view key documents such as their property tax and utility bills. Um, and of course, in a secure environment. Um, the other part of this is this, it's called HRIS My Way. And really what it is, it's an online payroll platform. So this is more internally, it'll allow employees um, to uh, review their um, time bank balances. Uh, it'll allow us to process T4s uh, online, uh, payroll stubs, submit leave requests, um, update um, TD1 information, track certifications, enter time, um, as well as uh, managers will be able to see and track HR and payroll data. Um, and the nice thing about this is the data from the HRIS My Way system, we do have it connected where it'll be an uploaded into our current VATM um, iCity payroll module. And that's really going to help us create those efficiencies to have um, more efficient payroll processing than um, a lot of it right now is paper-based. So the cost to implement um, these softwares, it's broken up into software fees uh, with implementation and then which are our one-time fees. And then we have licensing, which is annually. Um, so you can see here um, uh, for iCity Online and for the HRIS My Way, we have it broken down into those one-time costs um, and we have it broken down into the annual licensing fees, which are the, the annual costs, which will form into the next uh, part of the annual operating expense for future years. Uh, we are project uh, funding these through the uh, council approved at the last meeting through the Municipal Modernization Grant. And the Municipal Modernization Program, it, it really is intended to help small and rural municipalities modernize their service delivery uh, and identify new ways to become more efficient and effective. Uh, and they actually listed digital modernization as one of the key priorities under that program. So it really is a good fit uh, for those funds. Um, and those funds, uh, how much there is uh, in 2019, our prior received modernization funding of 646,946. And we still had at this point an uncommitted balance uh, of 155,000. Um, 910 uh, in the reserve from the modernization monies. And the total for this project will be 31,375 to initiate these online um, programs. So I did wanna get some feedback from the committee. Um, it's important that we continue, I think the momentum uh, to be moving things online and making things more efficient. Um, I think it's really important um, to, that we're providing that extra level of customer service for residents so they can be able to access things uh, more online. Um, so I wanted to get feedback from the committee on what other services um, online do you see as being a priority for residents uh, for moving online and for, or for providing additional functionality. I've got a question. Andy? Do I have the floor? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, I think this is a great initiative uh, and moving into an online uh, system is, is, is really good. However, I worry about equity of access to governance for people who may not have online access or may not be computer savvy. Uh, and they may have a pattern of interacting with the municipality over years uh, and would they still be able to interact with the municipality in the way in which they are accustomed to? Absolutely. So this is an, an additional functionality that we'll have to allow that. But any resident who um, currently gets feedback from the town, either in person, coming into the facility uh, or speaking to staff, um, whether it be over the phone or in person, all those functions will still be uh, available as well. That, that was my question. I, we, I didn't want to uh, support a situation which would lock out a number of people I know who are not computer savvy. 
Oh no, it's not about, um, uh, we won't be taking anything away. It's more, we'll more that we'll be adding this value value added. Um, Kayla, do you want to um, maybe stop sh the share on the presentation just so we can have um, the, there we go, better for conversation. Yeah. Great. Okay, that's, that's, but that's, that's, a, that's a great point. That's a great point, uh, uh, Andy, but we'll definitely yeah. make sure we maintain those other um, avenues of communication open as well. Yeah. Chris? Uh, from a customer service standpoint, is there any potential for bylaw uh, submissions and maybe follow up through a system online I'm just thinking I had a personal experience where I contacted Bylaw and uh, didn't get a satisfactory response. It just seemed like my query went into the void. And uh, despite a couple contacts, they may have been working on it, but there was no feedback whatsoever. When I did, I did bring it forward to council to be addressed. And it was the first time that a number of council members had even heard of it. So there just seems to be a disconnect from a customer service standpoint when something gets submitted to our third party bylaw, uh, whether it's being actioned, where it stands and kind of keeping everyone in on the loop. Uh, is there any functionality at all to deal with bylaw and uh, I said, online. So there's a, there's a couple of facets to that um, to that part, Chris. Um, I'll start off, and then um, Marina or Kayla might want to jump in on a little bit too. But um, for anything, um, I'm going to say, and not necessarily related 100% to bylaw, but if there's any time that any resident is unhappy or would like to put in a complaint about um, services that they receive, we definitely have a process for that. Uh, and it does form part of our, um, we do have a customer complaint uh, policy and we do have um, on the online forms that people can submit to have that. And it does go into a tracking system where you get um, sent a ticket and there is a follow-up process that um, that flows from that. So um, I guess I'm gonna say not stemming from the first part of your question, but from the second part, if you had a service that you were um, unhappy with, um, there's definitely a process uh, in order to address that. Um, for the first piece on the bylaw um, piece of it, um, I believe that the first part of that does go through um, our CRM system as well. Is that correct, Maureen? Yes. Yeah. It, it goes, goes through, through Access E11. Yeah. Our Access E11. So you have a ticket. So it should be giving you a ticket number. Um, and at the end of the point, if you're unhappy with how that was resolved, by all means, you can reopen that ticket and we can, um, it can, I'm going to say, generate more feedback. Okay. Okay. I, yeah, I was just wondering because the standard, like right now, when you contact from a user perspective, when you contact, you phone the phone number, you leave a voicemail, it gets transcribed to text, it gets sent somewhere, and then something happens. So that's just from my experience, that's what it was. So there didn't seem to be like a really nice front end um, to put it in there. So that's just some feedback that from my own perspective, um, I've had. Uh, now, another functionality, is, is there any way to put some municipal systems on there, like building permits, pet licensing, uh, just standard things that, that you, uh, residents would normally come to town hall to do that we can do through iCity Online? Um, absolutely. So uh, what we are doing on the building permitting side is our building official is looking at, it's a software called uh, Cloud Permit. Um, and they're looking to implement that um, later this fall, probably early um, early 2022, and that will bring building permits um, into the online forum uh, as well for that. So that's definitely one that we have uh, coming down coming down the pipe as well. So that's good. And I'm sorry, and what was the other one you had mentioned there, Chris? Uh, just like pet licensing. Oh, and gar garbage passes. <laughs> um, garbage <laughs> passes would be awesome because I've been doing a lot of dump runs and it, it really does mean a lot of points of contact right now, especially going during COVID going right in, getting it. And it's not yeah. always at the best hour. Is there any way that services like that can be moved online uh, for purchase? So the pet licensing, I believe is already online available for purchasing. Yes. Yeah. Um, and definitely we've been working with our um, website provider uh, to be working on uh, one for uh, landfill vouchers. It's a little trickier. It's taking a little bit more uh, backend work to try and, um, determine um, for the landfill voucher parts because there's lots of different pieces to that in order to get the information out to the landfill when he's receiving the information out there when someone comes up have they purchased the different pieces and the weight and the 
and um, all those different pieces. There's a couple more moving parts of it, but that one we're definitely looking at as well to try and find a way to move that into more of an online presence as well. Okay, great. Uh, overall, I think it's a great thing to be moving to give like Andy's concern was that would be taken away from traditional services. But I think this augments, the, I think you agree, Andy, it augments kind of what's being offered right now. Um, so it's a win-win for everyone. That's good. Andy? Um, I was going to bring up uh, building permits, uh, but there's, there's a whole bunch of things that the municipality uh, manages and controls. Uh, zoning uh, applications, uh, there, there's all of that. And some of that, like a building permit for a development project, is, is a huge amount of data. Uh, you've got uh, all the sewer lines, uh, power, access, roads. I just drive by the one on by uh, the restaurant on the way out toward the highway. And I look at that and I said, how many permits and how many drawings and how many uh, uh, engineer reports and impact, uh, environmental impact and so forth and so on, um, you know, to, to try to digitize all of that. It's probably all digitized in some way because it's a, it enters computers. But to try to make it uh, a simple, accessible thing, um, I think there's uh, there's a limit to what one can expect uh, the the municipality to make readily accessible um, because uh, you know it's it's, it's a huge uh, a huge packet of information to try to handle. So I think it's a great initiative. The more we can put online. But at the same time, we don't want to overburden the system and try to put stuff online that should actually be delivered in a FedEx envelope, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. Lisa. I just want to piggyback on um, what Chris was saying, because I got really excited with something Jennifer was saying, that they're, they're, and maybe this has been mentioned before, but it's only just sunk in. So we actually have, we have an actual ticket system when somebody request this, this, or the other. And then if I'm understanding correctly, things then get closed, that ticket get, gets closed when things are finalized, wrapped up uh, with the potential to reopen or a new ticket. Are those, are those metrics that we're tracking? Is that something that, um, you know, in terms of service levels and, and how long on average between a ticket open and a ticket close? Is that something we, we collect data on? Yeah, so this is our, when was our implementation date, Kayla? Last but, we went like October, November, I would say. So we haven't quite had the system for a year. We haven't had a full year yet of data. Um, and our first couple months, um, we're still getting people used to the system. I don't, we're getting data and we're getting it. I think a couple more months, Lisa, would give us a bit more uh, robust uh, information um, to tracking, but it definitely has a metric system at the back end of that program. Um, that does track those types of things. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't asking for it here and today. Yeah. I was wondering whether that was something, and definitely it'll be something I'd want to see it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it has that functionality for sure. Yeah. And if I could just add to, very often you will see that uh, the bylaw um, tickets are not finished up because if you have um, complaints about uh, overgrown grass or property standards that are um, ongoing, they will continue to monitor them. So you won't see the actual ticket closed because yeah. they're continuing to monitor them. They'll put them in that uh, the grass has been cut, but then they're continuing to monitor. So the tickets never sometimes isn't closed right away because they're continuing to monitor. So is there some kind of a tracking to, to you know, first touch, if, second touch to the ticket and when that all. If there is an email left, the uh, person who has expressed concern or a complaint will be sent an email um, on completion and as they are updated as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. And if Great. I could just add quickly, Lisa, too, we are also trying to move, like we've put a new, um, I'm gonna call it a new form on our website that's bylaw specific so that it helps the customer on the website not having to go through the entire listing that it is just bylaw specific form. It goes through our same system, but from the customer's perspective, it gives them the option just to submit a bylaw concern and gives those things. And that is actually, that form is gonna be updated in the next few months. The company that we use is actually doing an upgrade so that there's no more drop downs um, that you'll actually see the list drops down like automatically. So there won't be any 
having to click to drop down whichever one it is. Um, and then also I know Vila is slowly, again, it's a new system. They're getting used to it too. And we're trying to figure out how to combine more their voicemail to email into our new system too. So we are working with them, but concerns that go into that system online from a resident right now, they get those and they respond in that system. Um, if they get a phone call, it, we're, we're working with that right now to try and somehow combine those. So hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Andy? Um, some years ago, I was uh, hired by um, Natural Resources Canada to uh, do some training around managing your email. What they were worried about was the loss of archival data when the stuff goes electronic. Uh, and what, what happens when software becomes obsolete or uh, uh, disk reading machines are no longer available? And so how does, how do the archives, uh, how does a municipality manage its archives of this, the record of its decisions when stuff uh, goes into this uh, vaporware or, or what could become vaporware uh, when, when, it's, uh, when it's all electronic? So that, that was a very big concern for the National Archives. They thought that a whole chunk of Canadian history would, would not be available uh, because uh, of, of the, uh, the, the transient nature of electronic records. So as do you, have you talked about the archiving issue uh, related to your going online? I'll let Maureen speak to this one a little bit more. She's more the, the expert, but we do have a records retention bylaw uh, and it does outline for all municipal records um, the length of time that they're maintained and at what point they are disposed of. Um, so that would include, uh, it really applies for all town records. So anything that's not transient that does uh, meet the threshold of a town record uh, is maintained in accordance with that bylaw. Now, the ones that are transient in nature, Andy, certainly are disposed of in, uh, in our record retention bylaw. So we have a records retention bylaw that goes along with our records management policy that details um, what records go where and for how long. Yeah. And which ones are archival or not as well. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Equity of access and memory. <laughs> do you want me to go back to your slides, Jennifer? Or do you have, or is that the last one? I believe the feedback question was the last one. Yes, it was. Okay. Okay. So the recommendation is that they receive his information. All in favor? All right. Hi, Daryl. Hello, <laughs> Kayla. Hi, guys. Hi. Perfect. But the Corporate Services Advisory Committee received the licensing backyard hens presentation as information. Mover, please. Carl, Chris, Maureen, I guess. Just have a presentation for Maureen. Just one moment. Thank you, Kayla. So while I'm not the expert on backyard hens, and I will say yet, um, and council will have heard um, a lot of this presentation uh, detailed in a, a report uh, presented earlier in the year, I'm just going to give an overview uh, because we have notice on our website right now and the bylaw is due to come into uh, come back to council on September 27th. So just a bit of background on May 10th, a uh, notice of motion was put forward for the keeping of backyard hens. And on June 21st, staff um, presented to the uh, Community Development Advisory Committee. And then subsequently, uh, staff presented to council. And at that time, council um, received a draft license application, a renewal application, and a guidance sheet on the keeping of backyard hens. 
At that point, direction uh, to staff was to bring forward a bylaw for consideration of council to the August 23rd, 2021 meeting. Um, on August 23rd, um, a different staff member presented <laughs> the uh, report to council, which included the draft licensing bylaw, um, some uh, short form wording for offenses for the keeping of backyard hens, a draft guidance document and the draft license and renewal application. There was some discussion um, during that meeting with regards to increasing hens uh, to five and increasing some offenses and uh, both were lost. So the definition of backyard hens is uh, at the accessory keeping of hens for the purpose of companionship as a pet or providing eggs for personal consumption. And uh, hen coop is a fully enclosed weatherproof structure for hens and includes nest boxes, perches, and food and water containers. Now, the big deal is a hen is a domesticated female chicken that is at least four months old. I could never understand the difference between a chicken and a hen. <laughs> Um, and a hen run is a covered, secure enclosure that allows access to the outdoors. Uh, the licensing bylaw currently provides for hens only. There's no roosters allowed. And again, a maximum of four, and they have to be at least four months old. Uh, there is criteria in the licensing bylaw for eligible properties. Uh, properties have to be zoned residential only with a minimum of lot size of 500 meters squared and with appropriate setbacks. There are some ineligible properties, um, including apartment dwellings, condominium buildings, and properties that do not meet the minimum lot size and or have insufficient outdoor space. Uh, the criteria including setbacks for the hen coop, there's no coops and runs in the front or exterior side yard. There is a minimum setback of three meters from the property line as well as a 1.2 meter setback from the dwelling and any other accessory building, building sorry, and a minimum setback of 3.2 meters from windows and doors of dwellings located on abutting properties, and a minimum setback of 12 meters from institutional or com commercial land uses. Um, there can only be one hen coop and one outdoor run per property. The max floor area of 9.2 meters square for a hen coop maximum height of two meters for a hen coop, and a fully enclosed coop with ventilation. And if there is a heat source needed, CSA approved or rated and standards of the ESA must be approved. And the co-op has to be constructed to prevent rodents underneath and or within the walls and prevent entrance by other animals. Uh, the hen coop and run needs to be predator and bird proof windows and vents and there is a minimum one rodent proof food and water container and a minimum of one perch giving 0.3 meters of space per hen is required. There is also a requirement for sanitary conditions and the disposal of waste. Hens infested with insects and parasites must receive treatment in consultation with a veterinarian. Any hen owner is required to remove, compost or dispose of manure and waste in a timely manner. Stored maneuver is, uh, must be in a fully enclosed container, must meet the setbacks um, as previously stated. And manure cannot be used for compost, fertilizer must be removed. Sorry, manure not, yeah. <laughs> the requirement, um, deceased hens must be disposed of immediately and disposal must be through livestock disposal facility, a veterinarian or an animal shelter, and that is all at the owner's expense. Uh, inspections, the owners holding a coop license shall allow entry by an animal control officer to inspect the property to ensure all requirements of the bylaw are in compliance. And with regards to non-commercial use, uh, they are to be kept as pets and for personal use only. An owner of hens cannot sell or offer for sale or engage any part of the hen, eggs, manure, hen breeding, or for fertilizer production. And this is just, and it's a little small, I'm sorry, a list of the offenses under um, the bylaw. So this is what we um, call short form wording and they are attached to bylaws. And when someone is um, doing something against the bylaw, um, the animal control officer can charge them under 
the set fines. Now the set fines do have to go to the Crown Council to be approved, but they will come into effect um, and be enforceable once that takes place. So it usually takes six to eight weeks. And enforcement and fees, there's a $50 a fee for the initial license and $25 for the renewal license, for the renewal application, excuse me. And the issue of license will improve enforceability because the town will have a record of who is permitted to keep chickens. And bylaw enforcement uh, will be enforcing the licensing bylaw. However, at this time, uh, the time and resources required for enforcement will be better known uh, once we start receiving applications. And just next steps, uh, council's intention to pass the bylaw uh, is going to be posted on the, web the town's website or it should be posted already. And you will probably see it in municipal matters as well. And then the bylaw uh, to consider keeping of backyard chickens will be included on the September 27th council meeting. So pretty much an information item um, for, uh, for, the, for the committee and for the viewing public, uh, just to, uh, to show that the town and council is certainly interested in the keeping of backyard hens and you'll see it on September 27th. Marina, I just noticed something that I hadn't seen before, I'm sure I hadn't recognized before and that, uh, that's a, an example would be, I have four hens and I've complied with the regulations. Now I don't want them anymore, but you do. According to what I'm reading here, I can't give them to you. Or is it I can't sell them to you? Oh, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, I'd have to go into detail looking at the bylaw, Ted, um, okay. more thoroughly. Would you do that, please, some when you get a chance? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Because there's no other way of disposing. It mm -hmm. says the owner cannot sell or offer for sale or engage any part of the hen, eggs, manure, hen breeding, yeah. fertilizer production. So the concern is shall not sell any part of the hen, including the whole hen. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I will look deeper into that, but um, I think, think I think that the the hope from council is that when you're once you're in it, you're in it. <laughs> oh, turning <Yeah>. back, Dad. <laughs> it may be a bit of a concern uh, that we want to think about before it reaches council. And certainly, it is a you know it's a big big step for people. So I mean, I right. guess there is that responsibility that you know it's it's like an animal, right? Once you take them on, it's it's not always the easiest to to keep them. <laughs> Okay, I'll leave that with you. Anybody else got questions? I have a comment. Andy? Uh, my uh, grandson, uh, my, my daughter lives in Almont and the neighbor has chickens in the yard. I don't know what the bylaw set up as in Almont, but my four and a half year old grandson really likes talking to those chickens. <laughs> So uh, it's it it adds it adds a, a dimension to it because he's been cooped up. Uh, speaking of coops, <laughs> he's he's been cooped up with uh, uh, COVID yeah. and his uh, his relationships with a normal you know four year old kid on the street relationships haven't been there. So those chickens have played a very positive role in this kid's socialization. So I would just file that as a as a piece of information to be considered here. I think it's a good idea. That's I can understand that, Andy. Uh, I grew up with chickens, so I know they can be quite friendly. Anything else? If not, the recommendation is? For information. Information, all in favor? Carried. Next item. Let the Corporate Services Advisory Committee receive the election signs presentation as information. Mover, please. Go ahead. Lisa and Daryl. And I guess uh, it must be Maureen. Yeah. And while it, uh, just waiting for Kayla to bring up the presentation, while it won't impact the election going on right now, <laughs> This will be in place for uh, the municipal election 
and future federal provincial elections. Um, uh, there's no real hurry for it, but uh, it's nice to get it over and done with so that in 2022, we can bring it forward uh, and uh, uh, every one of our candidates will and federal provincial candidates will know uh, signage uh, going forward. So just uh, the goals of an election assigned by law, and I will tell you that the municipality only has a very small section in our advertising um, bylaw at the moment. So just uh, uh, a real goal of the bylaw would be to respect the need for candidates to advertise to electors, but at the same time, reducing sign clutter, uh, to protect vehicle and pedestrian sight lines, to de decrease driver distraction related to signs, and to achieve a more environmentally sustainable election. So uh, municipal, municipalities restrict uh, election signs actually both on public and private property in varying degrees. Uh, some ban election signs on all public property, including rights of ways. Some ban election signs on public property, but permit election signs on right of ways. And then some ban election signs on specific areas of public property, such as municipal facilities, facilities owned by local boards in municipal parks or heritage districts. Uh, election signs on private and pro public property for municipal, provincial and federal elections in the town of Armpire are currently regulated by the town of Armpire sign and merchandise display bylaw number 5209-04, and as well as the County of Renfrew guidelines for the installation of political campaign signs. So what does bylaw 5209 say? It says that election signs can be no greater than 5.0 square meters in area. Election signs cannot be erected more than six weeks prior to the date of the election. Election signs must be removed within seven days following the election. Uh, they're not permitted on any town of Armpar road allowance or municipal property. They must be set back in accordance with the following, uh, the street lot line setback of 1.0 meters, an interior lot line setback, a minimum of 1.5 meters, the driveway setback, uh, 1.0 meters, and traffic lights if a sign is more than 2.4 meters high, 15 meters. And any election signs in contravention of the current bylaw will be removed. Uh, and just uh, with regards to county roads, I, I, it's always beneficial for everyone to know which are county roads in the town of Armpar. County Road 1 includes Madawaska Boulevard, Madawaska Street, and Elgin Street West. County Road 2 includes Daniel Street and White Lake Road. And County Road 10 div includes Division Street and Baskin Drive West. Therefore, we are literally surrounded by county roads. Uh, so the guidelines for county roads, the signs shall not be permitted on traffic islands or medians along county roads. Large sign assemblies are not permitted within the road allowance. Smaller single post or wire frame signs shall be permitted along the edge of the roadway as long as they do not interfere with sight lines and the flow of motor vehicle and pedestrian traffic. And signs may not be attached to any existing sign posts or light poles along county roads and any signs uh, deemed to be creating a hazard will be removed. The signs can be picked up at the applicable county patrol garage and signs not picked up by the end of the election shall be destroyed. As well, candidates again have one week after the election to remove signs from the county road allowances and signs not re removed will be destroyed. So I, I, the deputy clerk and I will be working on a proposed bylaw for um, uh, to come into effect um, and we will be including definitions such as election signs, registered third party, third party advertiser, the help center revision center, which is uh, in fact the town hall, public property, road allowance, site triangles, campaign office and campaign office election sign. Those are just some of the definitions you will see in there. But I thought it important to um, uh, just advise in 2018, uh, there was legislation that came in with regards to registered third parties and registered third parties are individuals, corporations or trade unions, which register with the clerk for the purposes of conducting advertising, promoting, supporting or opposing a candidate or candidates for office at the municipal or school board level. And third party advertising is an ad that supports, promotes or oppo opposes a candidate or on a yes or no answer 
to a question on the ballot, as well a third party in this context means a person or entity who is not a candidate. Third party advertising is a separate from any candidate's campaign and must be done independently from a candidate. Um, and just so um, eligible, I just wanted to mention who the eligible, eligible third party adver advertisers are. Um, any person who is a resident of Ontario, a corporation carrying on a business in Ontario, a trade union that holds bargaining rights for employees in Ontario, um, groups or businesses that are not corporations cannot register as third party advertisers, and candidates cannot register as third party advertisers. Um, so what I am looking for um, is some feedback on the provisions in what we've got right now uh, moving forward and what um, I have been researching various election bylaws. So um, the size of our um, sign, no greater than five square meters in area. Um, so I am proposing no greater than 1.5 square meters in area. Uh, five seems um, very large. Um, I looked it up, uh, five square meters is 53 square feet, which could be a seven by seven sign, a six by eight, a five by nine, a five by 10 or a four by 12. So that seemed rather large. I could not find any other municipalities with um, signs allowed that large. However, open for feedback from council or from the committee. And um, I don't know if you want to uh, give me feedback now or as we go along, it might be beneficial. That's up to you, Chair. Well, if the committee has questions, let's uh, take them as we go along. Okay. Yeah, that I, would be I, helpful I, I, to me. Yeah, it, it's Sandy. I had I had a question about the five meters. That's okay. that's a really big sign. Yeah. Um, and I think scaling it down to one and a half square meters makes good sense. Yeah. So there's, I, enough, there's, there's enough visual pollution around anyway. We don't need that anymore. Yeah. And I agree with Andy on that, folks. So 1.5 square meters sounds quite reasonable to me. Five square meters is such a heck of a big sign. That, that's half a billboard, five I know, square meters. I know. You know, we, don't, we don't need signs up. No, there. I agree. How many feet? What size is 1.5 square 1. meters? 1.5 is 16 square feet, which could be a 4 by 4, or a 3.5 yeah. by 4.44, or a 3.2 by 5. Perfect. Yeah. Reasonable. We have a full screen so we can see who wants to talk. Chris. Uh, what are the penalties or costs for contravening the bylaw? Um, because if I wanted to go put a huge sign up and I just did it and there's no consequence to it, uh, I get a great bang for my buck. They just come and take it down later, but I got my huge sign up. Um, what consequences are there? Um, well, right now we have none. Um, so we would be putting in, we could put in short form wording uh, similar to what you saw in the backyard hens where there's a, there's a fee for it, like a fine. Okay. And if uh, signs are left up after the election and they have to be taken down, is the candidate charged that uh, whatever the, the, the town staff had to, uh, had to do how many hours they had to do? Yeah, we have, that cost? again, we've never charged for that. That is a consideration. Um, but we've never charged for it. Okay. So, Maureen, who picks up the signs? Is it uh, Public Works? No. So, who would pick them up are the candidates themselves or the candidates' workers? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I will. I will say we have not had very many problems with that. Um, I've never found it. Uh, we've had a few calls this year about uh, signs being in the wrong uh, places. And we just call up the candidates or the candidates workers and they I, remove them if they're in the wrong spot. So I, I have to say, we haven't had very many complaints. Anybody else? <clears throat> if not, then you wish to continue, Maureen? Yep. So the next one is the installation date. So for municipal elections, currently um, for municipal elections, it's six weeks, and I would propose the same. That gives um, that gives candidates a good a good six weeks of having their signs up if they so wish. I think that's reasonable, Maureen. 
don't have any comment on that. That's fine. Sorry, I just had one more thought about the size of the sign. Um, a provision that you can't piggyback on someone else's sign. So you cannot put your four by four sign or a couple signs on someone else's bigger sign uh, that is in a high visibility area that may get a lot of views. Uh, you can't just stick your sign right up in the middle of it because you're kind of piggybacking on a much bigger one. So if your sign is attached to another one, it takes into account the whole surface size of that sign that you're on. That's reasonable. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, Maureen. Okay. The uh, the next um, one is the provincial um, installation date. So uh, what again? What we had was current was six weeks ahead. Every every bylaw I have looked at has uh, said the day the writ is issued. So yeah. that seems to be the uh, standard response for that. Um, which I thought was appropriate. And looking at when elections happen, when the writ is issued, it's generally between 37 and 51 days, which pretty much runs into the six weeks. So I thought that was fine. Yeah. Anybody else? Not, Maureen, go ahead. Okay. The removal date, um, seven days. I kept that for uh, the all elections for our bylaw, uh, which I think is appropriate as well. Um, not, not every municipality gives that long, but with the county allowing them on there for seven days as well, unless and until they change their bylaw, it would be too difficult for us to manage uh, telling some to come off and some not. So, I mean, to me, all elections, seven days. Any questions? Yeah. And I will, I will say that it generally doesn't take seven days because candidates um, generally, uh, if they intend on running again, their, their, their campaign signs are worth something to them. So generally they're out there long before the seven days. Uh, placement restrictions. So this, so the town does not allow any on town road allowances. Um, they're only allowed currently on county road allowances as well as private property. Um, again, when I mentioned county roads, when you're looking at county roads, they really, uh, they really surround us. So other than being on private property, uh, there's nowhere for candidates to really place a sign within, um, I'm gonna say center town. Um, however, there is uh, the county well owns some property, but I believe it's our road allowance on the William on William Street on the north side beside the Algonquin Trail. And Ted, correct me if I'm wrong if that's not our road allowance. We just have a standard road allowance for okay. William. I think it's 50 feet, and then okay. the rest is the county's. Okay, and so there is no houses on that side of the road. Um, so I thought, like, as far as being in the center of town. Um, that might be an appropriate place to have some along there, uh, along the green space. Um, but I am, I am open for feedback on that. You will see that some people do put, um, some candidates do have their signs at that corner. I am, I am proposing along all of William Street where there is uh, no houses on that one side, on the north side only. So I would love feedback on that one. Hey, it would seem to me that the if the uh, uh, if they're on the county road um, on either side of the county road or on private property, uh, what other maybe it's municipal property is the only other available spots uh, to, to put like how many options are there uh, in terms of possible locations? Yeah, uh, and I think we should. Um, make it uh, accessible to candidates uh, to put signs wherever they think visually it's going to make a, a, a difference that, that they, they will be noticed. Uh, and so private property, county property, and then you're saying this William Street thing, that's municipal property. Are there other pieces of municipal property that candidates may be interested in using for advertising? There 
could possibly be. I, I personally have not heard of a lot. I know last in the last election, uh, some uh, would have enjoyed having, you know, the corner of John and McGonagall where we have a parking lot. However, we don't allow them um, downtown uh, in that area. And I'm thinking strictly, yeah, I only proposed William Street because it is one of our most traveled. We have a lot of traveled roads, but that is really the only one without houses on that side. Um, so yeah, I'm open for suggestions, Andy, if you can, uh, if you can think of anything else. Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't um, particularly enjoy seeing uh, the whole business downtown area yeah. littered with campaign signs. I, I think that makes your, your restriction there makes good sense. I think the, the idea is to put the signs where there is through traffic uh, so people can see it. Uh, so I, I don't have anything further to say on it besides that. Okay. Lisa. Just to comment on, uh, you mentioned McGonagall and, and John and that's that area there. My, my biggest concern would be, if you take a look at the last election, for example, we were 11 candidates running for council. Um, things get noisy. Um, you know, who's there first, who's there second. I, I think with what we've got, people can certainly get their message out. And if they can't, it's going to be really bold and say maybe they shouldn't have a seat at the table. They can't figure out, you know, how, how to reach the, uh, uh, the electorate. But uh, I, I'd like to keep them out of downtown, keep things clean and tidy. That's my view. Chris? Uh, would those current restrictions uh, cover Marshalls Bay Meadows and the fairgrounds just because they're not municipal roadways, they're private owned? I can just see someone wanting to dump a ton of signs right at the entrance to those subdivisions and they're uh, still a private developer space. Um, well, Daniel Street, uh, the fairgrounds, you wouldn't be going in there. Uh, as far as Marshall's Bay Meadows, you probably could go along the road allowance at the front of it, for sure, because okay. that would be county. Uh, that is a county road. I was just thinking in the subdivision itself. No, no, there be restrictions no, no. to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it would just be on private property in the in the subdivisions, and every okay. subdivision is just on private property. Every okay. other property is just private. I just didn't know if that mean non-municipal assumed road made any difference whatsoever. So no. that's good. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? No. The recommendation is. Oh, we're still we're still going, Ted. We're oh, still going. Yeah. Not Sorry, this. I just have to wait for the screen to come up. Uh, so where are we here? Oh, the sign setbacks. So the street lot line setback 1.0 meters or a little over three feet. Interior lot line setback 1.5 meters. Driveway setback 1.0. Traffic lights. If the sign is more than 2.4 meters high, 15 meters, I am proposing the same. And as I review this, I realized that I didn't put uh, anything in about the height of a sign. I put about the area of a sign. So I will look at um, some, uh, some of them that say how high a sign can be as well yeah. and when I bring that back. Any questions? I do. Got Chris? Yeah, uh, just about crossing uh, crossing ways. I'm just thinking out by uh, AJ Charbonneau, where we have that cross walk going across by the school. Is there a possibility to put a setback? Uh, just some of those little kids walking by so there, no one's distracted when they're trying to cross. So in front of institutional use, maybe or yeah, it's, or people? even with uh, crosswalks, yeah, I'd okay. say both are both are very valuable. Yeah, you're right. Um, certainly, the uh, it mentions traffic lights does not mention crosswalks. Yeah, I can I can throw something in for crosswalks too. Yeah. Right. I'm just waiting. Sorry for the for the. Uh, Next one, Kayla. Assigned deposit or removal fee. We currently have none. I was proposing none. Um, some municipalities do have it. As I said, we really haven't had an issue before. Um, so I wasn't at this time going to propose any. Um, 
I think I, I would leave it up to uh, the committee if they had any suggestions. Andy here, I think Chris's earlier point, if uh, you're using uh, municipal staff's time yeah. beyond a certain point okay. to clean up, uh, there should be a fee associated with that. And uh, more than just the hourly cost of that, there's the inconvenience. That person probably should be doing something else. Uh, so there it should be some kind of penalty sure. for, for littering or whatever you want to call it. Perfect. It hasn't been an issue, Maureen, has it? No. Okay. No. But if it were to become an issue, I can certainly appreciate Andy's point. Um, if it involves staff time, for sure, yeah. Chris? I was just going to say, it, it, that's the last resort. I'd give yeah. a little bit of a, a window there where people have a, a warning that, hey, these are out there, and if they fail to comply, then as a last resort. I know no one likes to, no one likes to set out fines at all, but if it comes down to it, but I think there should be a little bit of a, a window for fair warning. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, sorry, Kale, I should have printed this for myself. Uh, so additional restrictions, and these are, are some that I would consider um, and, and would be looking for your feedback and putting into, um, putting into the bylaw. So a lot of, of what I was reading and which would reduce uh, sign clutter is no more than two election signs per candidate or registered third party shall be placed on each street frontage of a residential property. Uh, any thoughts on that one? That, that, that one makes me smile. Yeah. Um, now what, what happens if you have uh, supporters of three or four candidates living in a particular house and they all want to put their signs up on the, on the law? Well, that it says per uh, candidate, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah. Lisa's got a hand up. Is yeah. the chair of Lisa's hand up? Yeah, and see, I really liked that one until Andy made mention of that. And I don't think it happens often because people requesting personal signs doesn't happen very, very often. But certainly, if there was, say, in a part of condo building, if you look at you know the condo buildings, yeah, and you have three people in the building who each want their sign representing. I mean, it's it's far out there, um, but I, I would never want to restrict someone wanting to support uh, a candidate. No, and very often the condominiums um, themselves would have their own rules um, from what I've read. So uh, a lot of those would have their own rules as to what kind of signage you could put out there. Um, but okay. uh, I, I we don't have any other apartment buildings where that would even apply in town yeah. that I can think of. Yeah. I don't think we want to make a public internal family political dispute uh, uh, evident to everybody that drives by a house with three or four signs in the front yard. Uh, that's why I smile. Yeah. Anybody else? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so... So that was on residential property. So no more than two election signs per candidate or registered third party shall be placed on each street frontage of a non-residential property. Same. Uh, no more than one election sign per candidate or registered third party shall be placed on a campaign office. And I only say that because uh, I wouldn't want to see all office windows covered with campaign signs. Uh, that was my own. Um, I did see that in some others, but looking for your feedback. Lisa? Campaign offices aren't wildly common, but having worked on a lot of campaigns in the past, more at the federal and provincial and having also taken advantage of a, a, having an office during the last one, I don't know if that's a reasonable one to restrict. If someone's taking the effort to take on a building to <coughs> campaign central, um, um, I, I, I don't feel it's reasonable. I'd have to sort of chew on that one a little bit more. I, I missed it when I was going over the uh, 
the package earlier on, but. Could it, would um, committee consider one per window? Are you talking just campaign offices or the business district? Just uh, campaign office. <laughs> a campaign office, that, that's the vibe. That's what's being yeah. created. Is, that's right. And, and to say that we're going to stifle that, um, I, I don't know. And, and I don't think it would matter to me who the candidate is. I'm trying to take myself yeah. and my own interest. Yeah. And, and as you say, we haven't had a lot of campaign offices. Um, provincial, federal, or municipal that I have ever seen uh, gone overboard, but that was something I had seen and I thought it was well worth um, bringing forward as to how many signs would be um, realistic to have in a window. Andy? I think that uh, in terms of fairness, if we get one candidate with a lot of money that hires, that, that manages to rent the vacant building that's you know 200 feet long, uh, how many signs can that person plaster on the side of that building if that's called their campaign office? Um, so I'm, I'm talking about the possibility of a scrupulous or unscrupulous type uh, advantage that might uh, might come up. However, if only one sign of our, if the maximum sign is that 1.5 square square meters, that seems to be a little chintzy. Uh, if, if I was if I was running for office, I, uh, I, I would want, you know, to be able to uh, shout out uh, in some way that this is my campaign headquarters. And I think a single sign like that at 1.5 meters may be uh, less than than I would want to put on the front of my, my campaign office. Chris? Uh, I think the intent is just to have it not be overwhelming. Uh, so how about a proportionate uh, ratio, like 25% of the visible surface area of the window uh, is the maximum that it can actually be covering. Then it's not taken up the whole thing. Then you have three quarters of the space guaranteed to be free of campaign signage. I think that's, that's kind of a good middle ground. Yeah, I think... <clears throat> My own personal opinion is that we leave it alone. Uh, it's uh, for such a short period of time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, like I say, if somebody has the money to rent a place downtown, good luck to them. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, for sure. I um, Not necessary to put in, uh, just uh, trying to think ahead. <laughs> I know, I know, Marie. Yeah. <laughs> totally understand. Yeah. Any other yeah, questions? I, I agree with that. Uh, just leave it be and let uh, good taste, if there is some, yeah. uh, rule that. Okay. Um, so not permitted on private property without consent of the owner or occupant of the property. I yeah. think that is um, pretty common, but certainly was not included in any kind of... Uh, bylaw that we have had so um does everyone agree with that yeah yes okay. i do um non-illuminated no flashing lights on it um for distraction purposes um that seemed to be a very common one now as well yep that's fine uh not permitted within 25 meters of another election sign for the same candidate so this is to try to spread them out a bit more, um, not have them every five feet. I must say that what I'm seeing now um, with the federal election is they do seem to be very spread out. Um, I don't know if anyone else is is finding that or, um, but just giving some kind of distance between signs. So 25 meters enough? I, I think, think that's, that's fair, yeah. Lisa? So that's, Siri tells me that's 82.02 .02 feet. Um, I think that's not actually a lot. I, um, quite often, not, not so much here, but again, on previous campaigns, that's one of the things that, that candidates often will do is they'll, you know, one, two, three, four, about every, every six feet, because those small signs then become like a big sign. But um and then, and then they might go 200 feet or 300 feet. It's just a different impact when they're one after the other. 
or um, I thought this was really clever. I saw one time where candidates will have a message that will go one sign, two sign, three sign, four sign. And of course, those are all for, for a single singular candidate, which would be outside of the bylaw if we move forward with that suggestion. Uh, and again, sometimes you've got corners, county corners, or um, you know where you might have two signs at 90 degree angles. And this, this bylaw, if we were to uh, make this change to it, would prevent that as an opportunity as well. I'd, struggle with this one. What, what do we have now, Maureen, for that? Do we have any? We don't have anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm inclined. So to it was to. certainly something I found in a lot of others and, and 25 was small compared to what I saw some of the others, because again, the goal is to reduce clutter, right? Uh, to reduce the number of signs out there to, so um, again, it's, I saw a lot more with higher than that, but but certainly, you know, 82 feet. I'm going to chew on it, thanks. Yeah. And maybe difficult, Marine, in the areas where there, say not Madawaska Boulevard, but maybe Daniel Street, where there are a lot of driveways and the properties aren't as wide, mm. that where you could put them 80 feet may just not be possible, but some cases 90 wood or 70, 70 wood, this is an example. Right. Yeah, if, if I could, I think Lisa's point, uh, like if you have a couple of signs on a corner, you know, traffic coming one way and traffic coming the other way, those signs are maybe 10 feet apart. But in terms of, of advertising, it, it makes sense to have that, uh, or it could make sense to have that. <clears throat> so to set an arbitrary limit of uh, 25 meters or whatever, um, may be problematic. Okay. Chris? I just worry about policing it too, because I can see someone getting petty and getting out there and saying that's 67.8 feet, <laughs> and then we have to remove the entire road worth of them. Um, not that I could see anyone posting something like that online, um, but <laughs> I could definitely see that being an issue where someone, you know, has an opportunity to wipe out a candidate's entire street because they're not within the, the scope of the bylaw. So, yeah, no, we can leave that one alone. Um, that's, that's fine too. That's, I'm, I really am appreciative of your feedback. So, um, and then not permitted within 50 meters of a help revision center, which is the town hall. So the town hall is where people come, uh, for help, uh, to be, um, to either vote or to, um, have their, um, the voters list amended, whatnot. Um, and, similar to a polling place where you're not allowed to have signs, that is what uh, the town hall would be considered. So just not within 50 meters. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Lisa? Um, on that one, we don't currently have that, right? Because if, nope. it, so my concern with that one is that uh, we're then removing the opportunity for anybody who lives within that range and has a residential address from exercising their own yeah. right to democracy and to show um, their support for any given candidate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that that's really where this committee is intended or, or where um, council is intended to. It, that's an uncomfortable place for me. Okay. That's a good point. <laughs> anybody else? Okay, I'll think about that one. <laughs> yeah, I think there's 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 a balance between yeah, for having sure. public spaces politically neutral yeah. and also having spaces able to be used uh, for purposes of promoting a particular candidate and how to balance those two issues and what's the happy medium. Yeah, for sure. Maybe if it was even just to specify residential property yeah. is permitted, but county roads or anything else would be excluded yeah. within that range, maybe that would be. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Yep. And I think the next one is similar. Um, and that was on a vehicle that is parked within 50 meters of a help center vision center. Just, you know, advertising now takes, takes many different uh, 
um, is in many different manners. So if someone slaps something on the side of their car, just that the car is not sitting right outside the uh, town hall. Any comments Andy. on that one? Oh, Andy? Yeah, if, if, uh, what happens if there's a campaign worker that's going in to get a dog license and his vehicle's parked right in front of the town hall? Uh, you know, like that's, there's, I have a question there. Uh, but the other thing is you don't want a sign plastered on the side of a, 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 of a, of a truck that's parked there for six weeks, you know? So there's, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, there's only a few spots outside town hall anyhow, so <laughs> they can park down the street. <laughs> but I will look at that as well. So, Maureen, one question, please. So, sure. who enforces this? Uh, by law enforcement would okay. be enforcing it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then um, just the the standard ones that we don't include anywhere, but really are common sense not permitted in a median strip, not permitted in a site triangle, not permitted on a utility pool. And uh, this goes for yours, uh, could be for yours as well, Chris, not permitted on any official sign uh, or official sign structure. So it could be going with that campaign sign as well, that, yeah. that other candidates campaign sign. Um, uh, shouldn't be attached or placed upon any building in such a manner as to obstruct any fire escape, fire exit, or to interfere in any way with the work of the fire department, obstructs the view of any pedestrian or driver of a motor vehicle, or visibility of any traffic signs or devices, um, and or impedes or hinders or prevents parking by vehicles on private or public lands or on a public highway. So though, I think those are those go without saying. Uh, they just we have not included them in a, in a bylaw. So just trying to make a more comprehensive bylaw. So what my intention would be is to bring back a draft bylaw to this committee um, in November, and then take a, a draft bylaw to council in December. But uh, certainly being bringing back the draft bylaw with your feedback in mind. Any questions? I think we dealt with them as we went along. Okay. What's the recommendation, Kayla? It's just as information. All in favor? Yep. All right. Next item is matters tabled and deferred. We don't have any. Don't think anyway. Staff reports, we don't have any. Nope. New business. Any items of new business, Daryl? Uh, Ted, can I just, uh, I, I, I already discussed with this with, uh, with uh, Kayla, but uh, I just want to re reiterate the fact that the Greater Arm Prior Seniors Council would be very interested in spearheading the uh, Welcome Wagon initiative that was uh, raised the last meeting. So just for the record, that's all. Okay, anything else? I, I did speak to Daryl just for the committee's benefit and I said that we would be speaking, we have mentioned it to the marketing and economic development officer so she is aware of it and then we will be speaking to her further about that. So just the committee's benefit on that. Thank you, thank you. That's great, Daryl, that's very good. Thank you. Anything else? If not a motion to adjourn, Lisa, Andy. Yep. All in favor? We're adjourned. <laughs>